Michael, welcome to the Fiduciary You podcast. Uh, I'm really excited to have you back on the show. Morning, Josh. Glad to be here. You're actually my second repeat guest. So we originally, uh, I think in late 2020, um, uh, I had you on the show. Uh, you and Fred Reich are the two, uh, the two repeat guests so far. So I'm glad to have you back. Really excited to dig into the, um, uh, the information that we're going to cover today, your 2021 Defined Contribution Consultant Survey. And we pulled out um, you know, a number of, uh, I think, key slides and, and data points from that presentation. Uh, and I can't wait to get kind of your insights on the landscape of the consultant advisor um, uh, world, if you will. Let me see if I can go through these slides real quick. Um, maybe talk a little bit about um, this is a really big study that that you guys um, that you guys do over thirty consulting firms, um, more than thirty thousand plan sponsors, uh, over seven trillion dollars in assets under advisement, and um, also pulling in uh, uh, plan sponsor data from T Rowe Price clients, where you guys are are doing the record keeping, and also participant data as well. So maybe kind of tee up, and could you just kind of talk about um, overall? What's the process um, that you guys that you guys went through as you kind of developed this? Yeah, happy to, Josh. Yeah, th this page represents to me one of the main reasons why I work for T Rowe Price. I've been with T Rowe about three years, but as you know, and many of your um, audience know, I've been in this business for thirty plus years. Um, but one of the things that attracted me to T Rowe Price is its ongoing commitment to primary research, whether it's in the investment analyst side of the business or it's on the behavioral strategic influences side of the business um and this is one of our big ones right one of our uh, marquee bodies of work that we do throughout the year in the retirement space you already mentioned the number of firms and you can see the 38 firms here on this slide that that are represented in the study it is you know, a big chunk of the industry. It's more than a enough to call it a representative sample of where I think the mid to larger end of the market is going. Uh, it is not about small plans. It is not about regurgitating just data points of existing uh, health of the 401k or retirement business. It's more about the strategic direction from those firms that are known to be influencers and innovators in the industry, right? Whether those are be more traditionally consulting firms, you'll see some of those, or more traditionally advisory firms, you'll see some of those. Purposefully, we went across that spectrum. We wound up with, you know, firms that tend to lean towards the mid to larger side of the business. You can find a couple of isolated examples where the plan sizes is probably smaller, but those firms are innovating in different ways. We were more focused on innovators than we were, um, you know, it, just the existing kind of rank and file, whether that's consultants or advisors. The other thing you, you touched on is this study, this body of work in and of itself was only one component that fits in these findings. When you see that dark blue there on the left-hand side above those 38 firms as you share these slides, Josh, that's coming right from these consultants and advisors. But when you see that greenish color or that gold color, that's actually plan sponsor speaking directly to us because we do primary research with them as well. Most of the content that we're going to talk about in this body of work came through a partnership we did with PNI, and we asked 500 plan sponsors a whole bunch of questions in a very similar fashion. And also the gold you see there, we, we, drop, we talk to 2,000 participants slash retail investors every summer in our retirement savings and spending work. And we tried to, you know, uh, bring those multiple perspectives together to show maybe some places where things are misaligned or some places where things are aligned between those different audiences. And the first time I came and talked to you a year plus ago was the actual launch of this study. We did it for the first time in 2019 slash 2020. This is our second annual and we are committed to filling this space on an annual basis. So you will see this coming from us with some really cool longitudinal work over time to continue to track kind of, the, I'd call it the tip of the spear where some of these advisory and consulting firms are kind of taking products, services, business strategy. Right. And that's how we're going to actually, I think uh, today we're going to cover what I would call maybe strategy practice management from these firms. And then we're going to touch on some more products and services as well. You know, 
how those are being kind of deployed currently within the marketplace. I thought one of the interesting things is um, even between the time that you did this research and now, if you look at some of these names, um, M&A is real within the industry. So a number of uh, the firms that you guys um, uh, that participated in the study now have joined other firms that also participated in the study. So, yeah, um, I mean, in, in a in a less than six month window from winter 2021, when we started opening up the survey to the spring of this year, 2022, and we finalized it and started reporting it out. You're right. Three of the firms on here are no longer independent. They've been acquired by other firms on this list. So, yes. They had good timing right, before, some, right before the market dropped. They had really good timing to, uh, you know, to, to, to sell high. Yeah. 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 It's some really good stuff. And you'll see all throughout our conversation today, Josh, I think the manifestation of the reason, you know, we always talk convergence at these kind of big esoteric kind of levels in the industry, but I think you'll see loud and clear where those firms that are on that path tracked by just pure M&A activity versus those firms that maybe aren't on that path and how their business models and their priorities might be different. Right, right. So why don't we get into the data a little bit? Um, I think there's some fascinating insights. Um, uh, you know, you hear about trends in the industry and things that are happening, but but I think you guys really dive into the data, some really interesting points. And, and you know, one of those is around price competition um, uh, and just overall competition, uh, how it's getting harder and harder, especially at the top end of the market, um, in my opinion. Um, and then that impact on, you know, on margins. And, and when I looked at the data, I think there's probably two drivers. There's obviously inflation and, you know, retaining talent um, and the cost of doing that, you know, wage inflation. Um, I've been hearing from advisors left and right how hard it is to find people, but how hard it is to keep the, their their people, that people are getting recruited away um, because it's it's kind of a, if you're a, um, you know, if you're an employee, it's a seller's market. I think the flip side of that, though, with margin compression is, and I think you see this in the data, is that advisory firms and consulting firms are having to do more for their existing clients. They're being asked to do more. And while they may not be getting fee compression directly, like you have to lower your fees, though I actually see that that happening at the top end of the market. I think the other thing is if you're anchored around your fees and you're being asked to do more, um, you know, that, that has kind of like indirect fee compression. But talk a little bit about, um, you know, we see kind of the, the top four, um, you know, our price competition, margin compression, we see re uh, retaining and hiring talent, um, you know, increased litigation or regulatory scrutiny, um, which I think because you're playing probably a lot of these firms are in the upper end of the market. That's a reality, you know, down market, you know, fiduciary liability and litigation, all that stuff, I think is probably oversold because, you know, the smaller in the market just aren't really candidates for that. And then the, the last one is just how to kind of transition clients to uh, from senior teams. And I think I'd be interested in your insights there or senior team members to junior team members. So when you look at this, what comes out and is really top of mind as you dig into, let's say, those top four things? Um, what are firms concerned about? Yeah, Josh, I think you. Th th there's a reason why we box those four. I think they are major influencers and drivers on the industry. I think we would all say, you know, nothing new in the price competition and the price compression front. That's probably been top of mind for most of these firms for a, a decade or more. The headline on that one is it's not abating. I think it's actually accelerating. I think uh, because many of these firms that we actually interviewed are innovating in how they bring themselves to the market and scaling up and bringing some large market services down to the middle part of the market. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. Some of these issues don't resonate as much in the small end of the market, but I would say that they either will or they need to be aware of what's happening just above them from a market size standpoint because it's changing the landscape. So 
I think the the line being drawn at the bottom end of you know mega market down to large market, maybe even into the upper end of the mid, is continuing to slide. And I think the price compression is going with it because of the scaling factor that some of these firms are bringing to the table. So and, it's and do you do, do you find these less consulting firms but more advisory firms? Um, yeah, it's so funny. I think we, we as an industry have always said that the vast majority of the innovation that happens in the D.C. space happens in the mega market. And then over time, it kind of right. works its way down. I think that's still happening. But I think there is a big I'll call it a bulge happening in the upper end of the mid market because of some of these firms that have figured out if they can bring the scale that mega market brings plan by plan, but they can do it by clustering together lots of medium size or smaller, not small, but smaller plans, then I think a lot of that innovation is actually coming from there. And that is vastly historically advisory oriented firms more than traditional consulting oriented firms. Um, and, and it is, I think, innovating in the marketplace as much so as some of those mega market offerings have historically done, right? And, and we'll get into some of this in a moment, Josh, but we'll yeah. talk about things like financial wellness and some of the managed right. account offerings. I think those are two very specific examples where that has happened. Do you um, think these advisory firms that, um, you know, if I would just paint a broad brush, consulting firms, I would say, don't do very little to, if any, um, work kind of directly with participants but now you're seeing these advisory firms, and we'll talk about that, like you said, with the data that are really trying to kind of uh, own and target the, you know, the participants, whether that be through like a managed accounts or whether that be through, um, uh, you know, cross-selling private wealth services, that they're willing to actually uh, drop their fees, if you will, as like a loss leader, because their strategy is, hey, we think we can make this up on the back end through, you know, let's say, cross-selling private client services. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that with one slight tweak. I think some of the uh, historically consulting-oriented firms don't reach out to the participant level in the same way. I think some of them have gotten quite good from an education perspective. But when it comes to actually trying to engage with a suite of products and services, I think that's where the difference is. And I think managed accounts, and I would just synonymously equate financial wellness in a new definition with those broader kind of wealth offerings that some of these firms that are more focused on convergence are bringing to the table. I would think of those as almost a synonym now. Okay. Um, and I do believe that is very different depending on the heritage or the tradition where these firms are coming from. Um, I think the on these four items that we're still focusing on on this page, two and four are related. So to, to move from the price compression into this war for talent, which I think is all the rage in the, the media right now, the way they're talking about it, it is real, right? Of these 38 firms, as we talked to them after the fact and begun these report outs on this study, I don't think a, a strategic conversation finished without someone saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody that looks like this, can you help me find them, right? right. Um, and you take that and you couple that just need for talent with the additional complexity of how do I manage my existing talent, which was made even more complicated by the pandemic and the virtual nature, and am I gonna let people work full-time remotely? Am I gonna have people come into the office at some point in time? Is there some kind of hybrid model? I think the the competitive landscape for hiring and retaining that talent went up exponentially because of some of those more softer factors about how I manage my staff. Right. And that fourth one about, you know, kind of the senior to junior handoff and how do I make that not a real or perceived takeaway from a client uh, satisfaction and engagement standpoint, I think is an outcome of some of the incredible growth we've seen from some of these firms that have been pursuing kind of this scaled offering over the last 10 years. I, I got a sense from a lot of those firms that they almost had this very barbelled workforce, right? They had the people that they built the business with 10 or 15 years ago that have been running long and hard and fast for years, but they haven't really thought about scaling up from an employment standpoint until they raised their head up one day and went, all right, I need more people. And if I'm going to need more people, maybe I need to organize myself differently. And maybe it's not just pure, 
you know, uh, growth oriented advisors in the field, but maybe I need some more service oriented people and I need people that are, you know, have different goals and have different job descriptions. And they start thinking about it, maybe a larger scale organizational strategy of how they, you know, manage their workforce. So I think all of that's kind of, you know, bundled up in those two items. And I would go back, as you mentioned, to just the fiduciary litigation issue. I think you're right. You said it's not a small market issue. I don't think it's a, a main driver with small plans, but I do believe the floor on that, you know, the bottom of where lawsuits are starting to, you know, show up and be a driver for people is changing, right? I mean, it's coming down to DC plans in general are getting larger, right? I mean, it's been, you know, a good 30 years now where some of these, you know, uh, plans have, have grown in and of themselves, or some of these providers are again bundling that last flurry of lawsuits we saw the last, you know, eight weeks or so where uh, all of a sudden they're, they're, they're questioning is the low cost solution always going to be the ticket to security. And if some of those lawsuits play out as they are intending by their wording of it, I think that changes the game again. And it's not so much about the plan, but it could become about the platform and the service providers as much as it is about the plan. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, pretty much it, 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 I, I kind of laugh when I think about the, these plaintiffs firms, cause now you're getting more kind of copycat firms that are in there that, that are seeing this as potentially a market opportunity. They're taking Jerry Schlichter's kind of playbook and trying to deploy that sometimes word for word. And I had Jerry on the show in 2021 and he, he said he thought the floor's coming down, but he thought $200 million in plan assets was kind of the was kind of the bottom of the rung just because of the economics for a plaintiff's firm working on contingency. But it's so, I just think it's funny with these plaintiff's firms now. They've literally made the case that pretty much every investment, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the prudence arguments around every investment. So, you know, first it was active and then it, then it was passive and then it was target date. Now it's managed account. They're just throwing everything at the wall and trying to hope they can, uh, they can get something to stick, uh, at least enough to shake, uh, shake some of these plan sponsors down. So, yep. Yep. um, and, and again, I think the makeup of this study, again, I'm not surprised that, that, that concern around increased litigation and regulatory scrutiny, is higher uh, just because this, you know, that's where a lot of these firms who I think responded, they play in that, they play in that market. Yep. Um, let me see. Let's go to the, the, the next. So uh, this was an interesting data point around uh, where consultant and advisory firms, their perspectives on uh, how they're seeing one another out in the marketplace in competitive scenarios. And so maybe explain a little bit about what's happening out there between consulting firms and advisory firms and how the, the lines are kind of blurring in terms of where hand-to-hand -hand combat actually takes place. Um, yeah, so Josh, this, this you know, uh, convergence of the competitive landscape, I think is a huge um, issue. Right. I mean, I, I think we've all been talking about some firms going up market, some firms going down market for several years now. And we have data that proves that many of these 38 firms are, in fact, doing that. Uh, I was shocked at how much the convergence of the competitive landscape has actually already happened. So if you look at the data we've got here and you ask advisory firms how often they're seeing large global consulting firms on the competitive landscape. It's the vast majority of the time they're seeing more traditional consulting, whether they're boutique or large global consulting, they, those tend to blend together, but it's, you know, eight out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times. You even flip around and ask the large global consulting firms with this relatively new aggregator industry subset that we've got, how often they're seeing them, it's still one out of four, one out of five deals. So the overlap in the competitive landscape, I think, is uh, to say the, the line is blurred, I think, is an understatement now. I think there's been almost a total mix of the kind of upper end of the mid-market right through the mega market. Yeah, I think probably the large consulting firms are like, who, who's, who's the new kid on the block, if you will? I, I just think strategically, though, you know, for firms that want to go up market, in my opinion, 
Uh, I think advisory firms like the ego stroke of working up market. Um, but there are some downsides to that. And I, I, I would just name a few. Um, number one is the competition just gets more fierce. Uh, and everybody is in, in that case is you're not competing against the two plan Tony anymore. You're competing against very legit firms. Um, clients are more demanding um, as well. And not to say you shouldn't go up market. I think the real opportunity for advisory firms that play in that, that, that upper end of the market is actually down market. There's so many more plans. There's so many ways to probably differentiate coming down market, especially if you can create and deliver a scalable, efficient service model. Um, those clients tend to be more loyal. They have less turnover on committees. So you're not feeling like you're constantly, you know, um, you know, on your, on your heels, uh, and having to go back and resell your services. Um, have you seen that at all? Like, um, as opposed to going up market and it sounds like maybe a little bit, but, but firms that are saying, Hey, we can take this larger market and we can start to drive it. You know, we can start to drive it down into smaller plans and bring that large market consulting approach and that differentiation. Yes. Uh, to answer the question very clearly, Josh saw it. I've seen a couple of different flavors as we dug into this data. I think some of the firms, the more traditionally advisory firms that were building scale, I think always had their sights on starting to grow up market and being more sophisticated with their offer and being able to compete in that uh, much more price sensitive and much more uh, product competitive space. But I think some of them never had that intention and just were scaling with a new business model, right? This kind of aggregated business model. And, and as they scale, I've actually seen some of those firms, their average plan size doesn't look like it's moving up at all. As a matter of fact, as they get the scale, it might even improve their ability to kind of drop the bottom on where they can afford to do this. I do think the real issue here becomes not just talking about scale, but executing on scale from a tech standpoint. It's not always the sexy front end, you know, kind of a robo advisory kind of um, reach to into the participant base, but it's also the back end operations straight yeah. through processing and getting, you know, humans out of that, that mix. I see a lot of data in here and qualitatively talking with these firms over the last six months they are focused on both of that. And I, I do think that's where the tech investment is heading now is making sure that if you are going to use a 401k plan as a low cost way of looking for your new customers, especially if you're in a model where you're converging wealth and retirement, you've got to make sure that the, the, where the rubber hits the road, you truly can do that in a cost effective way. Right. Yeah. Firms still struggle so much. And, and there's a few reasons why but struggle with a lot of manual manipulation of data and information which again just takes time and time impacts profitability and and uh and margins so um so we, we're seeing from this we're seeing just this this um you know the competition is 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 getting more uh, is getting more fierce what about yeah. Well, Go Josh, ahead. sorry to interrupt, but I say, yeah, jump to that slide right there because I think yeah. it just this is a little bit of the proof point of what we just right. talked about, right? I mean, you will see that there are the shifting down market and the shifting up market are on this chart. They're you know outside of the big box that we're really focused on, but you'll see those moves strategically laid out here. I think the in order to maintain a profitable, growing, thriving enterprise, advisory or consultant um, centric or otherwise, there's things you got to do, right? And that technology investment from an operational standpoint shows up here as number two, right? What also shows up as number one is just the top end. What am I selling into the marketplace and how do I continue to make sure that I'm with the competitive landscape or leading the competitive landscape and this general broadening service offerings, there's a lot going on in there, right? Yeah. And you'll see in some of the further data we discussed that uh, the, the broadening of service offerings can can cover a, a wide gamut. It could be things like 
managed accounts, which we've already talked about. It could be things like retirement income, which is taking a lot of the oxygen out of the room in many conversations, but it does look like there's a commitment to developing products and services there. Um, back to that scale, you see people looking to try to standardize the process so it's not custom, you know, from scratch every time they get a new plan opportunity. It's more of a standardized approach, not to say it's a standardized offer, but a standardized approach. And then the big one, I think, that is really uh, begging a question in my mind for a lot of these firms is delegated, right? So whether you use the term OCIO or you use the term 338, let's blend them together and talk about how you're managing the fiduciary responsibility for your client from an asset selection, asset monitoring, and asset management perspective. There is a huge shift there. And I think historically speaking, a lot of people were asking that question as a fee-for-service revenue enhancement perspective. And I think that's still a fair question for some. But that's also another scale question that people are asking. And is there a way you can do more with less because you control more of the end-to-end process right. because you're a full, you know, a fully delegated fiduciary from an asset management perspective? Yeah, I definitely, there, there were some things that jumped out here that, that just maybe to add a little bit of, you know, from the kind of former advisor and, and running an advisory firm perspective. Um, the first one about broadening, broadening service offerings, you know, it's interesting. Um, Michael Kitts is, who's obviously, you know, kind of the, the practice management guru on the, in, in the private wealth world. Um, uh, and has been a good friend for a long time. You know, it, it's interesting when he talks, he said that what advisors, you know, when you look at like what a lot of the robos have done, whether it's a, you know, a betterment or, you know, um, uh, you know, Vanguard or Schwab, everybody trying to kind of like roll out these, these robo platforms. What they've done is they've kind of dropped the, 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 the pure kind of portfolio management costs to call it, I don't know, 25, 30 basis points, something like that. Um, and what he says is that actual advisory firms, they, you know, they will maintain and really focus on trying to maintain that hundred basis points, you know, on average that, you know, private wealth firms charge, but the way they have to do it is value add up their services, um, which can impact profitability. It's like you, you broaden, you do more, um, but you're really trying to, you know, maintain kind of your revenue base. You know, you're trying to kind of protect your flank, not necessarily increase revenue, but protect the revenue that you're getting. But the way that you deliver that profitably is you have to get more standardized. You have to get more efficient. You have to leverage technology. I've said this numerous times on this podcast is private wealth advisors view technology as an investment. A lot of retirement advisors view technology as an expense. And, and you know, obviously I'm in the business now of, you know, selling tech to retirement plan advisors, but I think they really need to start to think about technological, um, uh, adoption as, as, as an investment. And if you can standardize and make things efficient, one of my philosophies is always that you standardize the process, you customize the relationship. Um, but under the hood, how do we make things look as similar as possible? It's going to take stress off your staff. You're going to be able to deliver a more consistent, uh, client experience. And again, I, like you said, I think that delegation, it may less be about, Hey, we, we, um, we may not be increasing revenue per se, but we can improve profitability if, you know, we're not having to get permission every time we want to make fun changes from a plan sponsor. And we kind of control that, uh, we get some lift on our business. So I think, you know, my experience and in dealing with a lot of advisors now, I think these top four absolutely um, is what I'm seeing out there as well. Yeah, Josh, I think if you uh, move to the next slide, I think you'll see some manifestation of that in the, you, one of the questions you posed in there was the, the definition of broadening the service offering. Is it is it just products? Is it also services? Is it, is it core to the investment lineup? Is it broader than that? I think the answer on both of those questions is yes. And what we uh, then followed up and asked a detailed question was, all right, from a products and services investment related, where is it you're focusing the kind of front end of the ship? And 
what, where are you making those big bets, both from a growth, but also from a profitability standpoint. And then we also asked it from a services standpoint. Hmm. And the headline I would tell you really is two from the top of this chart, one from the bottom. It's retirement income, it's managed accounts, and it's financial wellness, right? So, and, and interesting, if you really dig into this data, what you will see is the vast majority of these firms are making an investment in managed accounts, right? And there is a higher correlation with the more advisory oriented firms, historically speaking, than the consulting firms. It's it's higher in that subsegment, but it's high enough where you know it's in both, right? It's 67% of these firms are expecting growth in the managed account space, and half of them are expecting to do that with it also being an enhancement to their profitability, right? So a new offer that they think they've got a bead on, how they're gonna sell it, and do it profitably. Even more of these firms are trying to figure out how to productize retirement income. You'll see that's almost three fourths of these firms are making a big investment. That's why I think it's a little bit different now on the retirement income front. We've been talking about retirement income for years, but if three quarters of these 38 firms are saying it's one of my big investments and I'm gonna make a product or service offering happen in this space, okay, there's a lot of force at play in the market right there. Three quarters of them are making that commitment, but look at how much the profitability expectations drop off, right? I don't think it's as clear to them on the path of how I make this be a contribution to profitability, but I'm just going to have to get in the game and make sure I've got a, a product or a service in this space. And, and do you think part of that is, you know, what was interesting to me was the traditional consulting services. So like investment menu design, manager selection, Still, by far, 83% of firms said that was the most profitable thing you do. And I, I would say that that's probably the most commoditized thing and probably where advisors have been able to achieve the most scale um, from that. Um, managed accounts, advisors can kind of own, they can own that, right? Whereas with retirement income, like they're not owning that product. It's probably more of consulting on, well, which you know, guaranteed income product, you know, it's really around, you know, evaluation and selection and monitoring, but they're not kind of owning that. And that might be more of like a one time or, you know, every few years where, I mean, it's, it, that's part of the challenge with the product mix right now. Do you think that's partly what's playing out is because I'm not really aware of advisors owning the retirement income, kind of guaranteed income in product solution, whereas with managed accounts, they can own that, which might be where they're thinking that's more profitable because they own it and that's an ongoing revenue stream as opposed to maybe a consulting project around a guaranteed income solution. Yeah, I think historically speaking, Josh, you're spot on. I do see two things that are changing that I think that will become less relevant over time. One is the definition of what a retirement income product is. I think as recently as a couple of years ago, most people had a synonym between retirement income and a guaranteed income product. I think that's beginning to fade. I think, it, and, and we've got data in here, we can come back and visit at a later time, but the, the data to me says that this notion of thinking about the silver bullet single retirement income product being one and done versus maybe a whole series or suite of products, I think that shift is, is taken hold. And I think most of these mm -hmm. firms are thinking about retirement income much more broadly than just guaranteed income products. And if I actually, look, I, I think when I saw that, especially plan sponsors, when they're thinking about retirement income, I think the top thing that they highlighted was you know, flexibility around distribution options, if memory yes. serves me correct. You nailed it. So again, I think we, we, we get enamored in general. It's a human nature trait. I think we get enamored with the cool new toy, the shiny new toy. I think with plan sponsors and advisors, both advisors and consultants, the, the first place that people are starting to turn their head now from a retirement income standpoint is just plan documentation that allows for ad hoc loans or regular distributions without forcing a full distribution, um, making sure that the plumbing and the nuisance fees that might come from a DC plan, historically speaking, if you wanted to turn that spigot on without putting any new products and services in the lineup, 
That's job one, right? So like, I, so like I don't have to pay a $50 distribution fee every month when I want to take a distribution to generate some monthly income for myself. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that's job one. And then you look at eight or nine different other product types that we put out there. Most people, plan sponsors especially, said, well, I've got this, you know, QDIA, whether that be a target date fund, which is the vast majority of them, or a balanced fund, or in some rare examples now, managed accounts are starting to show up as the QDIA. Why can't I just, you know, let that ride, let the asset allocation ride? And the answer is, for a big chunk of these firms, that's probably a good answer. Right. For a big chunk of these participants, that's probably a good answer. But to get to the second change that I'm seeing happen, Josh, that I think uh, might challenge the historical definition of retirement income, I do believe some of these firms are getting into the retirement income space. And guess what? It's the same answer that we just talked about a few minutes ago. It's a managed account that they've yeah. moved participants to later in their working years, right? So. There's this notion out there of a dynamic or dual QDIA where you've got target dates for the younger population and you've got managed accounts for the older population because their needs have become more sophisticated or diverse or rich. Well, if you've got somebody in a managed account when they're 55 to 60 and all of a sudden they're thinking about, you know, when's the time to pull the ripcord and go into the distribution mode, are you going to pull them out of a managed account? And I think a lot of these firms now are thinking, well, I'm just going to take my managed account and create a income extension on that yeah. and maybe it's a change in asset allocation maybe it's truly a change in product some of them are playing around with guarantees some are not we've seen managed payouts that have guarantees that don't we've seen target date funds that are now building guarantees into that extended kind of you know um, the old through versus two language seems almost antiquated now it's more of just a slope of a glide path but you know, if you've got one that was intended to carry people through retirement, maybe I just need to throw some kind of security into that. And some firms are going uh, full force at saying the guarantees are still the complexity I can't figure out from a portability standpoint or from a fee transparency standpoint. So I'm going to go first to products and services that don't have the guarantee. Not that they're saying guarantees don't have a place, but maybe they're second or third in the queue. Yeah. And yeah, and just implementation product. I think you, I saw that in the data when I looked this, you know, guaranteed income, I think is growing in interest, but you know, I, I would still say it's, I'm not even sure we're in the first or second inning product wise. We might still be in spring training. The season hasn't really even started yet. And I think, I think from advisors I've talked to and consultants and also, you know, I think what I'm hearing them say feedback from plan sponsors is guarantee is interesting. It's on the radar, but it, just seems like it's 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 pretty early um, to kind of jump into the deep end of the pool in terms of you know innovation and product and implementation and you know it's interesting around the the the, the managed account. I mean, I I think back years ago, maybe financial engines. Obviously, they were the one kind of the the, the early um, innovators in managed accounts. But I think they had like an income plus product or something where years ago they were talking about. How do you how do you transition that into, you know, the retirement income distribution component? So definitely interesting uh, in terms of of um, as advisors are thinking about, you know, where are they getting the most bang for their buck in terms of services they offer and, you know, how to deliver those, you know, deliver those profitably. What um, what do you see? There, there, there's another slide we have here around um, DC market focus and then expertise uh, create differentiation. Um, just when I kind of saw this, you know, in, in part the move towards specialization, um, but a lot of, uh, and, and obviously scale fees. It's so funny you hear people talk about like fees, funds, and fiduciary is dead. Like I, I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I think um, if anything with the litigation, like those are still like the building blocks that you build your fiduciary house upon. But the ability to negotiate fees through scale, um, service models, the independent story. So what do you see? that these firms are doing to try to differentiate from their peers where everybody kind of says we do the same thing. Yeah. That, so I think a couple of things on this one, Josh, your, your comment about the triple F and whether that's irrelevant anymore or not, it's that I would laugh at that, right? It is, it's just the building blocks. It's the cost of admission, right? But if you're trying to differentiate your firm, assuming you've got those kind of basic 
um, core components of your business figured out, how do you look different than the shop down the block or across the country for you? Because again, because of digitalization and, and virtual nature, I think the competitive landscape from a nationwide standpoint has even begun to blend further down. I don't think there's as much geographic nature to any of the way plans are shopped anymore. I mean, right. the further down you go, clearly that changes. But um, if you look at this, I think a couple of things. One, specialization in the DC space. Um, you can't hang your hat there because a lot of these firms have hired and built out and dedicated very, you know, DC centric resumes and services. Important to have the capability, but from a differentiation standpoint, there's not much to hang your hat on there. I think what I would uh, suggest that firms do that are trying to work on their value proposition and think about how they're bringing themselves to market is maybe look down in the less um, competitive numbers on a slide like this and think about things like if you believe ESG is a building momentum and how you integrate that into your practice for investment selection, maybe there's some opportunity there because those numbers are still relatively low. I'm shocked at how low some of the numbers are on a more sophisticated AI data centric model. Look at how you're analyzing participant or even plan sponsor data and and make better suggestions for the future of the plan and the direction it's heading. I know I've heard you, Josh, mention multiple times that you shouldn't be driving the bus by looking at the rearview mirror, but looking forward and where things are going. I think the analytics side of the business is clearly the new frontier and making sure that you're thinking about how all of that, you know, delivers a better mousetrap from a products and services offering, whether at the plan level or at the participant level, because convergence is driving a focus on financial wellness, which is driving a focus on cross-selling services and opportunities outside of the traditional DC plan. Yeah. When I looked at this, I thought, um, you know, and I'm friends with a lot of the leaders of a good number of the firms in the study, but it was interesting. I, I thought that, that, um, these top four, um, it felt like an older playbook. It felt like something we were talking about five or 10 years ago. Um, you know, definitely the trend towards specialization, but like everybody's specialized that they, they tell that story. One of them was like having a superior service model. And that's one of the things I think advisors and consultants, like they want to sell around. Here's what we do. I think that's a, a, a backwards looking way as opposed to here's how what we do is going to achieve. This is where we want to take you in the future um, because everybody's service model is going to look the same when everybody looks the same and says they do the same things. Well, how do you demonstrate whether you're superior or not? It's really about the outcomes you achieved. And then even the independence from apparent conflicts of interest, you know, typically I would probably say that's around fiduciary, but like every one of these firms that is in this study, like that's not a, being a fiduciary isn't a differentiator anymore. Um, the real question comes down to who's the most effective fiduciary. What is it about your process, your methodology, your approach, your insights, your technological capabilities, your, you know, um, deployment of your intellectual capital? Like, how does that separate you from other firms? Your ability to, you know, drive change over time. So I just thought this was an interesting slide. I agree with you. Like, I wouldn't want to go and compete where everybody else is competing. I'd, I'd, I'd you know, um, I kind of think about those four things. It's like, it's like, you know, fishing in a pond that's been overfished instead of like looking down. Are there areas um, where you can fish in a stock pond, basically? Yeah, I think, Josh, one thing I would I would say to close this one out, which I think is really interesting, that whole independence of conflict. <clears throat> think about the there's a big division between some of these firms that, again, are more historically advisor centric versus consulting. Mm -hmm. And if on the advisor side, there is a, a leaning now and it clearly looks like it's manifest itself in this data to building out products and services that are literally white labeled with your name on it, whether that's a managed account or a retirement income product or in financial wellness, 
cross-selling some other more traditionally wealth-oriented products. Some of the firms that aren't making those decisions might scratch their head and look across the table and say, well, how do you stay free of conflict of interest if in fact you're pursuing that strategy? And some of the firms that are doing that would say, we're clear and we're clean with our process and our comp and all those you know, kind of questions and tests you ask from a you know, kind of a RISA fiduciary or legality standpoint. Yeah. But that's a raging debate right now where some of these firms are talking about things very differently from a conflict of interest yeah. standpoint. And, and I actually do think that I, I appreciate you bringing it up because I do think that's a, you know, a fair point. I mean, I'm, I was always more of, I would say kind of a purist. Um, but you know, so much of this comes down to, I think the, 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 if I look at that independence from apparent conflicts of interest, like I think the oper the operable word right there is apparent, right? Um, perceived versus versus actual. And at the end of the day, you know, it's it's probably who tells that story either for or against most effectively when they're sitting in front of the plan sponsor. Um, so interesting, interesting data points. Um, another thing, let's just briefly touch on uh, on PEPs. Um, there was some data that came out. I mean, I would argue that this is uh, probably much ado about nothing so far in terms of a, of actual uh, adoption and utilization. Maybe not, you know, we talked before we started recording about, you know, how many firms now, I think it's more of like, hey, we gotta, we gotta have a tool in the toolbox like everybody else. Um, there's a lot of registration of PEPs, but whether they're actually highly perceived from a plan sponsor perspective, and therefore, are they actually getting implemented adoption? Are they getting flow? Or is it more of like, you know, it's like my my treadmill I have in the basement. Yeah, I got a treadmill, but like my shirts hang from it right now. Yeah, I think there's uh, there's truth on both sides of that equation, Josh. I mean, if you look at the registration numbers and you look at the intent of these 38 firms, it's growing, right? I think it's it's popped over 400 PPPs are registered now on the DOL website. That's a big number. You look at these firms, of these 38 firms, between already committed or intend to do something, it's over half of these firms. So yeah. there's a lot of action. I think you're also, you know, spot on in that we haven't seen a lot of adoption. Some firms that have figured the process out would tell you they've, they've been selling dozens, if not hundreds of these, mostly in the smaller plan space, in the micro and almost startup plan space. But with that, um, a couple of isolated exceptions, it looks like it's, again, kind of a lot of noise, but not a lot of action. I do think it brings up a larger point around aggregation. And whether it's PEP or now the world of MEPs is much more open and conducive to plans joining or MEAPs or even just operational aggregation opportunities. I think if I'm, if I'm a advisor running my own practice and thinking about these implications for me, I'd take that big step back and just look at aggregation broadly speaking, look at those hurdles that are listed here on this slide as to why plan sponsors would either be fearful of it or hesitant to go down that path or what would be an incentive to go down that path and just reflect on your practice and see if there's something there that you want to pursue. Right now, it does look like it's one of those me too exercises, but could be building to something more meaningful over time as, you know, aggregation as a term has, you know, started to change the marketplace more broadly. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, looking at probably long-term trends. I mean, there definitely is an opportunity, but I even, you know, it's interesting in your data where, you, where we talked earlier about this move towards delegation and the 338, you know, 338 is not a new concept. Heck, I wrote about the value, you know, we, I was at 338 back in 2006, 2007, in my first book, Fixing the 401k, I talked all about like the benefit of a 338. You know, we're looking at 15 years later and you're starting to see comfort and you know, more adoption of that, but it's not like it's something that's, you know, it, the, a lot of these trends, whether it's guaranteed income, whether it's PEPs, whether it's 338, as you said earlier, um, you know, things typically start in the large market and kind of roll down. I think when you look at this data around PEPs, um, seems like there's very little interest uh, from large plans. This might be one of those ones where it goes more bottom up from from top down. But I think the key thing here and, and for advisors who are listening is, you know, it takes time for trends and product and service ideas to take 
route. Um, in many cases, not a year or two, but, you know, a decade or more. And so, you know, I always think about like Microsoft, like Microsoft has been very skilled at times, like they don't typically create markets and they're not typically like early entrance into markets. They let them shake out and then they build something awesome and they come in and use their scale and kind of dominate. And I would just say for advisors and advisory firms, be careful of, I got to go invest a ton, ton of time and effort and money and resources in, you know, solutions too early. Um, be aware of them, um, start to think about strategy, but, you know, you don't always need to be first to market um, in things, especially if it's going to take time to get adopted. So um, I think if it was me and I was still doing this, I think I'd probably be either in the considering, um, probably in the considering, not that I thought I would have used it a lot, but I'd want to have it in the toolbox so that if I came against a competitor talking about it, I could say, yeah, we do that too, but here's why I don't think it's right for you, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, all right, let's, um, let's, let's shift maybe a little bit. We've got, you know, a, a few more areas to cover. Um, but to shift more around kind of products and services and trends, uh, what's happening at the participant level. And, you know, we see here, um, uh, just what are you seeing from the trend of, uh, assets remaining in plan, um, post-severance, post-retirement? Yeah, Josh, I think this is one of the biggest areas. So let me be clear about what we're looking at here. We're going to focus on the right-hand side of this chart, not the left-hand side. And it is not survey data. This is one where we went over to our record-keeping platform, which has a couple of million participants on it. And we asked a question of that uh, record-keeping team, what's happening with people's assets after they terminate from the plan if they're 65 or older, right? Mm -hmm. So while they might not be listed as retired, technically speaking, they've separated service and they're over 65. And what's happening with that money one year later, two years later, and three years later? And it doesn't take a, you know, a, a data analyst to figure out this chart, right? You take a big step back, even with blurry eyes, you'll see the significant lower left, upper right trend. Mm -hmm. What that basically says is, as of the most recent folks that retired, that we can track it one year later, that's the people that retired or separated service in 2021, 56% of those folks a year later still, I'm sorry, 58% of those folks a year later still have their money in plan. So over half a year later. If you, tra if you track that from left to right, the 2020 retirees, two years later, still 51% of those folks have their money in plan. Two years later, right? When you're retired, two years is a lot of time, right? It's not, can't imagine it's that they haven't had time to think about it. It's two full years later and they're still there. And then three years later for the 2019 retirees, it's still 48%, yeah. right? So I've looked at this data off and on. I've worked for several record keeping platforms in my career and these numbers are significantly higher than I've ever seen. Now, what we don't know is why, right? This is just a observed data. And I've had in the conversations as, as we've talked about this data, I've had all kinds of a range of responses, right? The most salient of which to me feels like, with exception of the last month or two and the spring of 2020, for the last decade plus, every time they've looked at their account balance online or if people still get statements and look at those things. The news has been good, right? I mean, it's been a long run. So as my dad would have said in Oklahoma when I was a kid, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I think some of that's going on in here. But if you notice the uptick started in 2015, 2016, which is, if you recall, was when the first fiduciary rule started to mm -hmm. kind of rattle around in the marketplace. So I think there's more going on than that. I think plan sponsors and advisors in general are considering stay in plan as a maybe more realistic option. I think we all know that the reason why the vast majority of assets used to roll out within a year or two of retirement was from a personal service delivery, that one-on-one -on -one advisory relationship that a lot of these people turn to in this complex stage of life of figuring out the drawdown strategy. You can't replicate that inside of a DC plan, historically speaking. I think 
Now there's a lot of advisors and consultant firms are saying, how can I help plan sponsors maybe think about that a little bit more and, and at least make the offer more robust? Right. No, I think that's, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. One thing I do want to highlight actually on this slide, it's actually the left-hand side, and I'll just make a quick little comment is, you know, you, you, you hear certain corners of the, the country and, and usually kind of outside the industry talking about how, you know, DC plans, the 401k is kind of a failed experiment and all of this. But I actually think this data, you know, do DC participants report more financial progress than their peers? I actually think, you know, this data absolutely shows why we need to increase coverage. You know, 84% of DC participants were saving for retirement through their workplace. If I were, if, if they were a, a participant in a DC plan, 84%, um, if they were eligible, but non-participating, you know, uh, 30%. Um, but then some other things here, like I just look at like the financial peace of mind, the behavioral emotional, um, you know, 80%, if I read this right, 80% of participants, um, how am I reading that? 80% yep. of participants expressed financial peace of mind if they were participating in their workplace retirement plan. Um, only 56, 57% of people, if they either didn't have ac access, so a coverage issue, or they weren't actually participating, which again, I think goes back and supports why we shouldn't be doing things like sweeps and, and um, getting aggressive around automatic features to get more people participating. They're going to be saving. They're going to be saving for retirement, for emergencies, and they're going to feel more confident about the progress they're making than if they're not. Yeah, Josh, since you brought it up, I think you've exposed a couple of really important points. To me, someone who's been inside the retirement plan industry for 30 years, I look at some of this data and go, blinding flash of the obvious, right? Because right. people have been saving week in, week out, month in, month out over all those working years, of course they feel better, right? But I think you're right. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that are still casting stones at whether the D.C. workplace retirement plan industry is a success or a failure. I think this just proves that it's a raging success. Now, are there challenges? Absolutely. And going after more coverage seems to be akin to making people sit in a better place from a self-satisfaction and ready for retirement when just when you would want your elderly population to be in a state of comfort, at least on the issue from a financial perspective. So I, I do believe this affirms that. I think that little nuance you were picking up on the fact that eligible non-participating people are actually lower than people that don't even have access right. to a plan. There's something going on there that I think ought to be informing some of our design thinking. And maybe it does get back to that simple, keep pushing auto features, keep doing full re-enrollments and, and make sure everybody has to, you know, kind of go through that experience. I, I think it's obvious that maybe some people that have chosen not to participate might have larger issues at play that we don't even, you know, can't understand from looking at data like this, but there's something there. And I do believe you're right. It does tell a story about what DC plans more broadly deployed can do for people's financial well-being and their peace of mind. Right. Absolutely. All right. So let's kind of shift um, and, and this kind of the back end, I know we, we I kind of jumped backwards on this real quick and I apologize about that, but, you know, we're seeing this trend, as you said, over, you know, one, two, three year post, um, you know, post retirement, post severance that assets are staying in the plan. This kind of data here is really kind of highlighting, if I look at it as maybe a combination of. Uh, access to lower costs by remaining in plan and also a broader kind of fiduciary architecture oversight um, by staying in plan. What do you see when you look at the data here in terms of, um, you know, why retired participants are choosing to stay yeah. in plan? Yeah, I think, I, Josh, I think this slide is is a tale of two cities. I think you you picked up on the first one. If you look at the top, both from advisors slash consultants and plan sponsors, the the I think the big item is lower cost, right? I mean, a lot of retirement plan advisors have worked hard over the years driving those costs down, 
And an institutionally priced retirement plan, even of a modest size, more often than not, is going to have a lower price tag on it at the asset, for the assets than an individual retirement arrangement. Okay, that's right, right? I think there is some coalescence around that. I think the fiduciary oversight and 40 plus years of ERISA, I think that also shows up actually surprisingly more so with plan sponsors than with advisors and consultants, but it shows. The interesting, the other, the, the, the second city in the tale of two cities, look at the bottom. If, if in fact you do believe that low cost is a reason why a participant would consider staying in a plan, what are you doing about it? And the bottom of this chart shows it's not nearly as much as you would expect, right? So on the left-hand side, that big, tall green bar is what percent of plans are at least making people aware that they can stay in plan and some vague, you know, uh, details about that option. Three out of four plans are doing that. But go over to the middle and you'll see uh, assess, re assess relative costs. And less than one in five plans are actually taking action to say, if you stay in the plan, you're going to have lower cost investment options, likely have lower cost investment options than if you go out to an IRA. So yeah. opportunity truly from a DC advisory standpoint or consulting standpoint to work with plan sponsors to say, if in fact you do believe X costs are lower, then what can we do Y to make that more actionable for your plan and for your participants? Well, and I think the where the calculus really comes down to is well, what services are you comparing? Like advisors aren't going to be delivering like their private wealth, comprehensive planning services in plan to participants, in my opinion. Um, that's you're, you're really comparing kind of apples and oranges. So if you just look at the investment component, yeah, maybe costs are lower, um, but are you getting kind of the same services and what, and that's, you know, you look at the, the, you know, the DOL, you know, rollover rule and now starting to bring, you know, bring, uh, bring transparency. It's been interesting. I've been talking to, you know, private wealth firms. Um, I'm actually developing a, a based on some advisor feedback um, that'll be out in a couple of weeks is a, a DOL um, kind of rollover compliance tool. Um, but I've been telling private wealth advisors, like you've been, you haven't been living under fee, you know, disclosure, uh, for the past, you know, 10 years, like retirement plan advisors, like we're very comfortable talking about fees to clients. Um, it's going to be a whole new ball game for you now when you have to start doing, you know, a comparative analysis and whatnot and having kind of those conversations. So it'll be interesting to, you know, it really comes down to, I think, what services are pr being provided, not just the pure cost, you know, without any other uh, uh, mitigating factors, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, Josh, I applaud two things. One, your effort to try to build tools and resources for advisors to have a more healthy conversation there. And two, thinking about this looking forward in a very different, with a very different lens than how we've looked back, right? Because I, I do believe that a big chunk of that upswing and people staying in plan is already that issue of exposing kind of fee disclosure versus less transparency. And if you're thinking about a value proposition based on a broad set of services, advisors should be confident and be front footed in that process to articulate all those other things that yeah. they do that why have 98% plus of most retirement income portfolios been in the IRA market because of all those other services that don't show up when you just do a pure fee comparison on the investment products. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very few private wealth advisors like to talk about fees. They haven't really been pressed on it. If they do, it's, you know, basis points, not kind of dollars or whatnot. But I would just say in general, like, you know, transparency creates trust. That would be my advice for advisors. Obviously, a lot of retirement advisors are used to doing this, but transparency creates trust and lack of transparency destroys it. So, you know, you better, yeah, my argument is always like, I want to, I want to be proactive on those conversations, not reactive. I want to control that narrative. I don't want to be on the defensive against it. So um, another element is that the interesting data, um, and this is actually comes from participants, uh, when it comes to tools and education and guidance, what are you seeing uh, from this data in terms of what participants are actually interested in and asking for? Yeah, I think this one's uh, a very interesting one. I'm going to jump out in front of the data. If you look at it, it is not segmented by age. We have looked at it by age, and interestingly enough, 
there's not a big difference. Most people would assume that this would fluctuate between older population and younger. We have seen a fair consistency. I think the digital age is upon us all. And I think what I'm sensing by the way our participants, and again, there were 2,000 of them that we interview every summer and ask these questions of. So it's a significant data pool. Um, almost everybody, again, regardless of age, regardless of income level, begins their journey at figuring out what they need from a financial planning standpoint with tools and resources, independent of talking to an individual, right? I think that's the first takeaway I have from this slide and the data that we found. Retirement is still front of mind for them. How, am I gonna have enough money when it's time to take the gold watch and sit on the rocking chair? Um, and the exploratory way in which I'm going to evaluate that is going to start with some self-service tools, even some education. And I think this was facilitated even more so by the pandemic. We saw huge upticks in digital consumption of education materials during the pandemic, right? For all the painful reasons of job loss or maybe hour reduction or just all of the stuff that we saw happen in the early pandemic. And, and then still shows that a, a big chunk of people, not the majority, but a big chunk of people are interested in that personal face-to-face -face guidance of one-on-ones, but only at the right time in the right place. Uh, you know, you, I've even heard stories in focus groups where people are afraid to engage because they're afraid they'll look dumb. They don't even know the right questions to ask. Well, I think why you see these digital resources on the left is they're trying to get some baseline and they're trying to get themselves a little bit smarter. And I think that, again, that is happening. I, I, I think that uh, the silver lining of the pandemic is that people had a you know pretty shocking wake up call. You, we've always heard the stories about people can't come up with X hundred dollars for an emergency expense. I think that kind of came home to roost. Mm. And you've seen all the debt pay down statistics that have come out of the news since then. I think that manifests itself here. And I think you've got people that are trying to make themselves more healthy financially on a broad on a broad basis. Yeah, this this was, uh, you know, it's interesting. I did a study uh, at Green Spring, surveyed, uh, had almost 2000 people completed as well. And we were talking before we started recording and I was kind of we were kind of comparing the data. Very, very similar um, in terms of like highest preference for, you know, tools and resources um, and then kind of this move, you know, uh, to guidance, to advice uh, as well and really you know, making sure it's not kind of a, you know, an either or, but really having kind of a, a suite that's available, uh, a suite of resources that are available so that people can interact and engage in a way that is more personalized to them. In my data, what was really interesting was actually uh, people under 35 expressed the highest interest in one-to-one -one meetings, even higher than people that were, um, you know, 55 and above, which fascinated me because you, you, you hear all about how like younger folks just want like digital and it's like, no, they expressed a much higher interest in one to one kind of face to face. So really, really interesting. I think this data kind of supports why you're seeing more advisory firms getting into and saying, hey, we're really going to try to ha use our participant services, engagement experience as really kind of a tip of the spear for us. What um, what about some non-traditional, right, outside of retirement? Um, you've got some interesting data here around uh, things like H HSAs and student debt programs and emergency savings. Like, what are you seeing out there uh, from that standpoint? Yeah, I, I think another, um, I'll call it silver lining of the storm clouds of the pandemic was taking this nebulous term of financial wellness, which there were probably as many definitions as there are people in the room having the conversation and and having a few things pop and move forward that look more specific as far as products and services that could be offered that would help people be more financially well. Right. And and the first one that popped up and we've said this a couple of times on this call. Um, what's old is new again. Right. It's, it's not like HSAs are this new thing. Right. They've been out there for decades now technically, but it does look like in the spirit of pulling all the levers that an advisor or a consultant can pull to help a plan sponsor help their participants more broadly be financial well, HSAs are big 
And I think they're accelerating, right? I mean, there's the, there's the logic of all the triple tax free nature and what that can do to help people have money for the single biggest expense they might have in retirement, which is healthcare. So I think that is there. And I think from an advisor standpoint, I think people are seeing there's a pivot going on from health savings accounts, maybe historically being more health spending accounts. And now it looks like they're starting to accumulate assets and doing lineup analysis and comparing them to the DC plan. There's all kinds of advisor opportunities inside there. It does look like the, you know, the, the upswing continues to accelerate on HSAs. The two new shiny toys in this space, I think, are student debt, right? Since the Abbott Labs letter came out, you know, several years back, people have been saying, what role do student debt services play? And can we play with the match? Can we do other financial things to make the power of the workplace retirement savings work beyond just saving for retirement? Because we all know that debt payments are going to take away from retirement savings. Student debt now looks like it's firmly taken hold. It wasn't just a flash in the pan. Uh, more and more of the advisors and consultants we talk to are deploying some kind of specific debt payment services, if not in the DC plan, akin to it in a way that it looks like from a user experience standpoint that it's integrated. So I think there's there's movement there. You can see the data proves that, that a lot of uh, these firms are, are pursuing that. And then the other one is emergency savings, right? I think that if you think about it, that one's probably been at the top of the list from a Washington, D.C. perspective. How do we help people yeah. get better? Can we use the power of negative election and payroll deduction, which is clearly proven that it's made people more healthy from a retirement savings standpoint? Can we leverage some of that same framework and apply it toward emergency savings? All kinds of raging debate about whether or not it can be within the D.C. plan or not. I mean, we could get into all kinds of arguments on that technically. But thinking about it as an offer that's packaged up and bundled from an integrated standpoint in a financial wellness offering seems like it's a foregone conclusion now that that one's got some traction, too, and it looks like it's growing. And this, these things here could be, I would imagine, that broadening of service offerings that advisory advisory firms and consulting firms are thinking about doing? How do we, you know, um, how do we do more for clients? Um, you know, and maybe part of it is, a, uh, you know, there's a revenue enhancement element to it, or more, it may just be, we want to make these relationships more sticky, show more value. If we do, we're less inclined to potentially, you know, we certainly meet the needs of everybody, but strategically we're going to be less inclined to, you know, getting kicked out because we're not doing enough or letting one of our competitors kind of get in and then, you know, uh, you know, nudge us out at some point in time or, or, you know, make it way more competitive for us than we need it to be. With the vast majority of these 38 firms we talk to under that broadened service offering, something under this financial wellness umbrella was clearly part of their intent, right? right? There's more to it than that. There's stock plan. There's, you know, those right. retirement income and managed account products we talked about earlier. But this played a key role in a lot of those firms' decisions on how to broaden their offering. Right. All right. So let's, our kind of last point as we wrap, um, just talking about, you know, wellness solutions. That seems to be the most adjacent um, for especially advisors and advisory firms adjacent solution and really kind of bridge between, you know, plan and wealth if convergence is something that is a kind of a key strategic priority for firms. Um, I thought this was just fascinating. Um, and I actually, it, it just in terms of consultant firms who offer financial wellness solutions, um, you know, uh, versus, you know, advisory firms and why that may be you're seeing consulting firms see advisory firms kind of show up more in their traditional, you know, relationships. Yeah, I think that's right, Josh. One of my personal experiences throughout the pandemic was the firms that looked like they were bouncing back the quickest and recovering and getting back on their feet were the ones that were talking more broad than just retirement savings. They were talking about leading to better outcomes and overall financial wellness solutions. And when we asked the question up front of all 38 of these firms, are you doing something in the financial wellness space? The answer was the vast majority had said yes. But as we poked in a little bit deeper, the offer from more of the traditional consulting firms was, 
We're going to help you, Joe or Jane, plan, sponsor, figure out whether or not that record-keeping platform's financial wellness offering aligns to your needs, or maybe even go to a third party like a financial finesse or others and and see if those products uh, meet your needs. Almost all of the firms, consulting and advisory otherwise, said yes to that question. But when asked a very specific question, are you going to offer your own proprietary financial wellness solutions wrapped around the retirement plan you're administering, that's where the big divide on the right-hand side of this chart manifested or showed itself. Almost all the advisory firms answered affirmative to that question. Almost none of the consulting firms answered affirmative to that question. So again, back to the change in competitive landscape, whether it's moving up market or moving down market, you can put that aside and say it doesn't matter change to the product offering, right, in a, in a more broad definition yeah. of the solutions you can bring to the table. It looks like there's a very, very different approach to this marketplace, at least currently speaking, from traditionally advisory firms to traditionally consultant-oriented firms. Yeah, and, and, and I think what this also, from, you know, from advisory firms, again, the line's blurring, but advisory firms want to own the um, – I don't like I, there's you hear a lot around like who owns the participant like I hate that I and, you know nobody owns the participant but clearly advisory firms want to own the participant experience um, and you've got this interesting thing going on now like this I've talked about it before but this real frenemy thing going on you've got you know a lot of the the, the larger record keepers that they're looking at all this data and saying hey how do we keep you know, assets on book or how do we drive additional kind of, you know, revenue, um, especially in the era of probably declining margins or, or fee compression and whatnot. And so you've got these, these, you know, record keepers who are trying to deliver their own, you know, um, participant advisory services and, and kind of that experience. And now advisory firms that have, you know, wealth units are saying, whoa, hold on a second. And, I, I think as you, you continue to probably see this play out, it's going to be in some cases, you know, an advisory firm, even if they have their own wellness solution, may let a record keeper with their own solution lead because maybe the demographics of the plan aren't very good for like private wealth perspective. I think in other cases, you're going to get advisor advisory firms that are saying, hey, back off, like we really, really want this. And if they've got the institutional scale, those record keepers are probably going to be more inclined to, you know, play nice in the sandbox around that um, just because of the institutional relationship. And then I think in some cases, and I know this is how we kind of used to handle it um, when I had my firm was like, you know, to the record keeper, like, great, you guys tell your story, we'll tell our story and, you know, let the best story win. And we'll kind of, you know, we'll kind of duke it out and let participants kind of choose with who they go to for advice. Is that what you're kind of seeing out in the yeah, marketplace as well? Absolutely, Josh. And I couldn't agree more. I hate the own the participant language. It's just horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, but if you do think about the entire symbiotic relationship of all the members of the food chain that service the retirement industry, whether it's the advisory firms or the record keeping platforms or um, any other influencer and player in there, it's a symbiotic relationship. And I think the one where the real momentum is right now is where people figured out what I can do versus what you can do and how we can do that together and respectfully do it in a way where the, the you know, competition exists, right? Any good record keeping platform now has got a great, you know, financial wellness offering. Uh, we like to think some better than others, hint, hint. Um, but doing it in tandem with key client relationships, whether that be an advisory firm or a consulting firm, and make sure we know how the uh, offer manifests itself in an integrated, simple, friendly way at the plan sponsor and the participant level right. makes all the difference in the world. And it does look like there's great momentum on the uh, frenemy front on that front right. in the industry. So, Right. Well, um, you know, as we wrap, Michael, this is, this has been, uh, I always love talking to you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, a data and research geek. And I, I just, I love the work that you do. Um, you know, I love the, uh, your ability to pull out not just the data, but, but, you know, the, the, um, uh, the ability to kind of draw the conclusions and see where things are going. Um, you guys put out a T row, uh, you know, I used to in, 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 
you know, my books I've referenced you and a lot of my, when I, um, uh, have always kind of tried to educate, you know, my core audience, whatever that looks like. I've, I've relied a lot on the data that you guys uh, have created and, and, um, just kudos to you. I think every advisory firm, um, consultant should be looking at this data, um, to really kind of see, you know, what's happening and what's over the horizon so they can get positioned to know how best to deal with whatever, you know, might come their way. So what would be your number one kind of, if you look at all of this, what would be your single best piece of advice to advisory firms and consultants about the current, current environment? Like what should they be thinking about at a kind of strategic practice management level? Well, first of all, Josh, thank you. I also enjoy our conversations. A lot of uh, creative sparks fly when we have these kinds of dialogue, and I think the more the industry can participate in them, the better. The key takeaway, I think, is there's there's a, a bunch of forces at play here that we sometimes treat as individual and discrete forces, but the better you can take a step back and look at them as overlapping or symbiotic or integrated, the better I think you're going to be as an advisor managing your practice and your relationships with your not only plan sponsor clients, but uh, individual investor and participant clients. Um, the examples are numerous in this conversation. Retirement income and managed accounts, are those discrete forces at play or are they overlapping and integrated? Is the change in the competitive landscape a cause or an effect? What's going on with financial wellness in this term convergence we always talk about? How much do they manifest themselves out in the marketplace in the way we think about products and services coming to market? Uh, taking them holistically and looking at them as best you can in a, with a strategic lens on the impact it's going to have on your book of business and, more importantly, where your future book of business is going to come from or how you're going to retain what you've got, I think drives a holistic view, which I think will make you worry less about the individual forces at play, like price compression, and think more about the holistic value proposition you have to the marketplace, because it is clearly a dynamic one. Right. I, I think that's, I think that is great advice. So Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. Great conversation. Uh, I'll make sure to put links to, um, you know, this report and then your other thought leadership resources um, in the show notes. But I've really enjoyed our conversation and uh, always appreciate uh, the vantage point that, uh, that you have in the industry. Thanks, Josh. Great time together.